if I go with a diversified for portfolio, what does it look like in terms of growth, value, microcaps, dividends, et cetera, gold, cash, stock, crypto? Um, that is a great question. That is one of the holy grail questions for all investing. Um, and for 60 or 70, maybe 80 years, academics have tried to answer this question, KS, but they haven't come to a, a consensus. And I don't think they ever will, because if you are going to know the best portfolio, the only way to know that is to know the future, in which case you wouldn't even need a portfolio. You would just buy the very best investment, right? And so it's, it's very hard because the past doesn't necessarily uh, equal or predict the future in investing. We can generalize a couple of things, but I will tell you, I saw a Wall Street Journal piece uh, maybe a few years ago. They asked, four or five different, uh, three or four or five, I forgot how many, uh, financial planning type firms to say, okay, here's a typical, here's a certain investor, give him or her your portfolio recommendation. And the pie chart looked like very, very different from each different advisor. Okay. So nobody can agree on this stuff. Academics can't, practitioners can't. Some basic principles that, that I would like tell my own son or what I follow myself, start with Welcome to The Early Advantage. I'm your host, James Early, and this is my show where I talk about what I think people are missing or what the media is missing on interesting, relevant, important stories of the day. It's going to have a couple of segments. First, I'll find one of those stories, something that I think is, is a key thing on people's minds, and I'll give you my perspective on that. Then we'll have an interview. This week, it's going to be my friend Alan Jaglinzer, who owns the accounting department at Cambridge University. I'll also address some questions, some Google searches people are wondering about, and some audience questions. And then we're going to wrap up with a screen, a Bloomberg screen, from my colleague Brian Christopher, who runs the Follow the Money newsletter service, where he shares a couple of, of stock ideas or stocks from the screen, not, not formal recommendations, but ideas you can check out as starting points. So speaking of starting, let's get started. Um, why, why are stocks down? That's a key question on, I think, everybody's minds, or really what to do about it is the key question. But a lot of people are wondering why they're down and how does the interrelationship between inflation, interest rates, and stock prices going down work? Because that's going to affect things when they go back up as well. And I got the genesis of this idea. When I read a sell-side investment banking report, I won't name the analyst or the bank, but it was talking about biotech stocks. And it said biotech stocks are down because there just hasn't really been a lot of good data, a lot of good news, a lot of big news released in biotech recently. That's superficially true. Oh, I mean, that is true. That is true. But I think that's only a superficial driver of the decline in biotech stocks. And it's not just biotech stocks. The real driver of the decline in biotech stocks, or 80% of the decline, is the same driver for the decline in tech shares, the decline of S&P 500, and so many other shares that are down these days. So let's talk about that. First, as you can see in this, in this slide here, courtesy of Yahoo, certainly the S&P 500 biotech ETF is down. All right. Yes. But it's not just that. Peloton is down. Peloton is the, the bike company that was really hot during the pandemic. AMC Entertainment. This is the, the CEO that wears no pants on the Zoom calls. Also down. Hertz Global, a rental, rental car company that was kind of left for dead and, and suddenly it became this weird like cult stock. Down also. ARK Innovation ETF, the poster child for everything that's hot and sexy and and just frothy about the recent market. Kathy Wood's ETF is down. GameStop is up. Not everything is down. GameStop is up much better than $4 where it was before. Those guys have parlayed the meme popularity into certain economic benefits for the company. We won't go too far down that hole. But in general, most stuff is down. I think we get the idea. And it's down because interest rates, oh, sorry, inflation is up first. That's step one in the recipe we're going to talk about. This is U.S. U.K. is similar, actually a little bit higher. What happens when interest rates go up? Well, what happens when inflation goes up? Excuse me, I gave away the answer. Interest rates go up. Now, the, the central banks were a little late to the party this time. This is U.S. Fed funds rate. Fed fund rate differs from the Bank of England's bank rate. The bank rate is actually literally a lending rate to member banks uh, with the Bank of England. The Fed fund rate is actually just a suggestion. The Fed doesn't literally set it. Banks have to keep certain minimum reserve balances on, on uh, uh, 
on a deposit at the Federal Reserve. And if they get a little bit low, uh, they have to they loan each other money overnight. And that's at the Fed funds rate. Uh, it's technically between those banks, those commercial banks. But the Fed is kind of like the godfather. It makes an offer these banks find hard to refuse. So they generally comply because they really they fear more draconian measures if they don't. Anyway, these Central banks raise some sort of like key initial rate first, and that trickles up and out into the economy over time. And that's how interest rates work. And when interest rates go up, stocks go down. We all know that, right? Well, mostly. Okay, mostly. This is the interesting topic of the day. The FTSE 100, which tends to be more industrialized, tends to be more bricks and mortar, steady, stable, cash flow generating type of companies and financial companies is actually not down over the same time period. It's kind of flat, or maybe it's down depending on the day, but it's you know basically not down in the same way. And even with shares that are down, look at the S&P 500 in the light blue compared to the Invesco defensive ETF in red, all courtesy of Yahoo Finance, I should add. It's almost, almost 10 percentage points better. Defensive company meaning like, not like guns, but like steady, stable, kind of boring types of companies. So boring stuff is either flat or like just down, you know, somewhat sexy stuff is way down. And why? That's our question of the day. Well, we know that whether it's uh, a, a euro, a pound, excuse me, a euro, some Malaysian money. I knew I'd have a use for this money one day. Some Mongolian money, uh, U.S. dollars or RMB. Um, this is about as sophisticated as my props get. Um, it's, a, it's a low budget show. Uh, whatever the money is, we know that money promised today or offered today is worth more than money promised tomorrow or years out into the future. And we know the further into the future, the, the less that money is worth or another way of looking at it, the more you'd have to promise or more you'd have to expect from a company to make it equivalent or make it hard for you to decide between a pound right now or a pound something in the future. That's called uh, present value effect. We also know that the riskier a company is, this is the, the uh, vertical axis on this chart, the more you'd expect. In other words, if, if government bonds were paying 4% per year, you'd at least want 4% as a base. Uh, a company that's just maybe a little bit more risky than that, maybe you'd want 7 or 8 or 9%, but a company that's much more risky, you would, you would expect 15 or even 20% return per year and you would use that as your discount rate. So the punchline here, imagine, let's say, a biotech, which is at the extreme end of the bell curve. A lot of them don't even have revenue. A lot of them will start making money, profit, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years into the future. Okay? Look how they look on this chart. If you have a 12% or a 15% rate, now these, these, these values are not actually zero. They're 0. 0.000 something, but they're pretty close. Those far off distant cash flows, just the mathematics alone, make them worth almost nothing today when interest rates go up as they have. And in some cases, if you look closely on this chart, you can see that a three percentage point rise in interest rates in some cases cuts, cuts the, the value in half or more for that year's cash flow. And this is the boring math story that you know, the media or a lot of financial commentators don't want to tell. But this is the reason, this is 80% at least of the reason that all these shares are down is simply that interest rates are going up. Okay. It's not just, you know, the biotech nuances. That's five or 10% of it. Okay. This is the real story, guys. So that's really what I wanted to say today. Um, let's cut to the Google searches and let's do this in lightning round style. And lightning round style requires actual style lightning around glasses. All right, quickly, are we headed for a session? I don't care. I don't care. I'm not really mad about that, but I don't care because, number two, we don't know for a while. See, a recession used to be technically defined. Uh, the U.S. has the National Bureau of Economic Research. The U.K., I think the Office for National Statistics does it, but by, by two consecutive quarters of GDP shrinkage, and generally, people are, or definers are moving away from that definition, and, and just kind of defining it as a period of bad stuff. And they need to wait for the data to come in. And then they wait for the data to come in, and then they revise the data, or they then the data gets revised, and they wait for that. And so they call recessions pretty far after the fact. That's why it doesn't really matter, like, right now. I mean, you know, the reality is what it is, whether it's technically a recession or not. Um, the, the bigger risk is 
are we going to have stagflation? Okay, I don't really care about recession. I care about stagflation. By the way, recessions t typically, typically, six months to a year and a half, uh, and the markets tend to rebound pretty quickly. Uh, I've done some analysis. If you read my South Bank Investment Daily letter, uh, I've talked about this. Uh, in England, in the U.S., wherever you are in the world, recessions, bear markets, they seem so bad. They seem bad at the time, but they tend to be bounced back from very quickly. Um, inflation, though, is what caused that really long, drawn-out bad period in the 1970s. Stagflation, I should say. Stagnant economy and high inflation. Central banks are squeezed then because if they raise rates too high or high enough to kill the inflation, they get the inflation down, but they also really bring the economy down. The U.S. had the Volcker recession when Paul Volcker, who was head of the Federal Reserve back then, raised interest rates really, really high, and it, it worked, sort of. Um, so that's what I worry about. It's hard to predict. Um, but in inflation, what is inflation? Inflation is rising prices in a, in a simple sense. Uh, there are two ways that can happen. They're kind of the... the the more uh, innocuous way is supply chain issues, you know, things like that, or maybe a short-term temporary uh, boost in demand. Uh, I say those are not as big of a deal because those tend to be resolved quickly. Once the supply chain block gets resolved, then those prices settle back down. Now, the more insidious inflation that the real, you know, hawks are worried about is caused by inflation in the money supply. When the money supply doubles, triples, quadruples, and then it starts moving around, you know, velocity of money goes up, right? Then you have just a quantity of money issue and you have a more structural inflation that's hard to deal with. And the argument, they say, is that we have so far mostly just had kind of the supply side inflation and now we're about, sorry, the, the supply chain type of inflation and now we're about to have the money supply inflation kick in. I don't know that's above my pay grade, but those are the two dynamics. All right, here's why I don't worry too much about inflation. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but the same thing is true in the UK. Uh, I think in much of Europe, maybe not in Japan, but uh, in general, stocks go up. And stocks go up because stocks represent value added by companies to mankind, to humanity, and companies are adding more and more value over time. I think as an extreme example, we've probably made more progress, we as people, fighting cancer in the past 10 years than perhaps in the past 100 years. So, hey, that's an exponential increase in value. It's, it's fair for that to be reflected in, in stocks, and that's why people say buy and hold companies for the long run. Now, if your time horizon is just a couple of years, this could be bad, because what if you happen to be holding during one of those dips and you need the money? But that's why a lot of people, including myself, say don't put money into shares, into stocks, if you're going to need that money in the next five years. Because what if, what if you're holding during that bubble, and you, or that crash of the bubble, and you need the money? All right. Um, back to inflation. This is the imputed, imputed inflation expectation from U.S. Treasury uh, inflation protected securities. In other words, when these are uh, securities whose prices adjust for inflation to factor that out. And from those, you can divine investors inflation expectations. And it's just 2.3 percent for the next five years. That's actually pretty good. So the market is betting that the Fed is going to get inflation under control. And the same thing, or at least the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development economists are, are betting something similar in the UK, in the US, uh, and in the euro, euro area. Um, they think it's going to come way down. Now, the, the glass half empty type of person would say, yes, inflation is going to come way down. But if it comes way down, it's going to be because there's there's a recession, um, in which case, yeah, bummer. I, you know, we'll take it. We'll see what comes. Um, what to do, though? What to do for now with inflation? And again, don't go crazy because we may not have inflation for very long. But the traditional advice, which is good to know and then to ignore, is you know, inflation protected securities, Timberland Gold. Bitcoin has not done very well, obviously. Uh, gold has been kind of so-so. Um, commodities are usually good in inflationary periods. But, you know, these rules are meant to be broken, and they're broken all the time in, in investing. So don't get too wet into this. I just present the traditional knowledge just for your, for your edification. All right, let's go to an audience member's question. Okay, if you've got questions yourself, just send them in. Send them and find a way. We're going to get an email address up here pretty soon. Uh, if we don't have it this week, we'll have it soon. And I'd love to answer your questions on the air or on the show. Um, first question, this person sends us several. KS, I will call him or her. KS asks, you know, does market cap matter? Uh, you wrote about micro caps a lot lately. KS, thank you for reading what I've written. Um, 
And what is kind of what is market cap? Well, market cap, yes, is number of shares outstanding times price per share. Market cap is essentially the equity value of the company. You could also have the value of debt, right, to get the sort of the total capital market value, and then and then cash, which you could actually deduct from that if you want to compute what's called enterprise value, which is sort of the you know, if you wanted to buy a company and blow it up on TV for a, a, some special event, it's a ridiculous thing, but you would pay enterprise value. In other words, it's like buying a car or buying a house when there's cash inside. You can deduct the cash you found from the price, okay? Um, float is a different concept, but related. Sometimes a company will have a big market cap, but only 20 or 30% of that is actually actively trading as, as float, and that affects people generally more who are bigger investors. They, they may not be able to buy as much or as much at the prices they want. Um, market cap is a factor you look at when you're determining uh, buying companies or maybe uh, how to diversify your portfolio. I would say don't make it the only factor. Uh, related, another question, KS asks, if I go with a diversified portfolio, what does it look like in terms of growth, value, microcaps, dividends, et cetera, gold, cash, stock, crypto? Um, that is a great question. That is one of the holy grail questions for all investing. Um, and for 60 or 70, maybe 80 years, academics have tried to answer this question, KS, but they haven't come to a, a consensus. And I don't think they ever will, because if you are going to know the best portfolio, the only way to know that is to know the future, in which case you wouldn't even need a portfolio. You would just buy the very best investment, right? And so it's, it's very hard because the past doesn't necessarily uh, equal or predict the future in investing. We can generalize a couple of things, but I will tell you, I saw a Wall Street Journal piece uh, maybe a few years ago. They asked, four or five different, uh, three or four or five, I forgot how many, uh, financial planning type firms to say, okay, here's a typical, here's a certain investor, give him or her your portfolio recommendation. And the pie chart looked like very, very different from each different advisor. Okay. So nobody can agree on this stuff. Academics can't, practitioners can't. Some basic principles that, that I would like tell my own son or what I follow myself Start with ETFs. Start with exchange-traded funds. Those are the healthy, lean meat, the broccoli, the salad of your portfolio. Um, low fee, easy to diversify. Then add on shares on top of that. Uh, keep the riskier shares in smaller quantity, generally speaking, just like desserts or sweets. Again, this is general advice, and your, your feelings may differ. It depends on uh, how much time you have to invest. It depends on your level of wealth. It depends on your, your risk tolerance. It depends on your current job. In other words, if you work in uh, a tech company, you may not need to buy as much tech because your income stream is also from tech, right? Your finances are already exposed to tech. So a lot of factors, you can't really give blanket advice, but you want to diversify across factors. Like uh, market cap is one, growth value is another, dividends may be another, sales growth, like how fast the company is growing, uh, location of domicile, is it uh, UK, EU, US, all these things academics call factors. And the more factors you're exposed to, the more diversified you are. It's that simple. Um, another question is, stocks are going down. Should we, should we hold the positions? Uh, should we sell out now and wait for the bottom to buy back? Or kind of what should we do? And that's a question, I think, on everybody's minds. It, it, let me tell you first off, it's very, very, very hard to sell out now and buy at the bottom because nobody ever knows when the bottom is except in retrospect. Uh, statistically, if you're dollar cost averaging or pound cost averaging or euro cost averaging, you'll actually do a little worse than if you just buy a lump sum. That's because statistically the markets tend to go up like two thirds of the time. Of course, in a period when the market's going down, that advice wouldn't hold, right? That would be the exception, not the norm. A general safe blanket idea is to just buy, if you have an income, to buy in regular increments. Uh, that way you're, you're spreading your bets over a variety of price points. And, and that's what I would, you know, that's what I would tell my son. That's what I would do myself. Uh, don't go too crazy time. Trying to time the market, it is, it is very, very difficult. Uh, people say they know, but they don't. Um, and I, I think that's about it. I, th I think these other questions really kind of circle around this. Oh, one, one more. Okay. Some microcaps have debt, uh, which one of the editors, the South Bank editors, said is bad. Should we ditch these companies uh, when interest rates are rising? Good question. Yes, if you have debt, especially if you have variable rate debt, you, you don't want interest rates rising. And that's why a lot of people are so worried about countries, too. A lot of countries have a lot of debt, and if interest rate 
debts rise, it becomes harder for them, the U.S., the U.K., and others, to service that debt. So they, they kind of have like an incentive to keep interest rates lower. Obviously, if you have very cheap debt and it's fixed, you don't worry as much. Um, the other thing is, so, so I wouldn't say sell everything, but it's certainly a factor to consider when you're looking at a rising rate environment. The other thing is, remember that bonds get hit hard when rates rise, or existing bonds get hit hard. If you have a bond uh, that you bought for 100 pounds and it pays you five pounds a year, a 5% yield, and now new bonds, let's say they cost 100 pounds again, but instead they're paying you 10 pounds a year. This is an exaggerated example. Um, if that happens, though, nobody's going to want your old bond unless unless you drop the price roughly to, to 50 pounds, okay? Because in that, that five pound per year payment equals a 10% yield, which sort of matches the new bond. So this is, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that's the principle with bonds. That's why they drop when interest rates rise. So that that's it for the Google searches and for the reader questions or audience questions. If you have a question, again, let me know. I'm excited now to move to the other two segments of the show, please watch. Please watch Alan Jagelinzer's. We talk about disinformation, which is something that I think people are also definitely not talking about enough. It is a factor not just in politics, not just in social media, but now in financial markets. And beyond that, remember, stay tuned because Brian Christopher is coming with some specific shared names from his Bloomberg screen. When I think of disinformation, the first thing that I think of is you know, big authoritarian or, or usually communist governments putting out propaganda to, to shape the minds of their people, countries like Russia or, or North Korea or, or China. And if you push me a little bit more, I might think of uh, political situations like the U.S. election a couple of years ago with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. In other words, uh, you know, political campaigns using social media to attempt to, to shape the minds of voters. But this information it is those, it is those, but apparently it's, it's a lot more. It's even affected business and investing, two worlds that we would think would be relatively insulated from, from disinformation. And my guest today is here to talk about exactly that. His name is Alan Jagelinzer, and Alan is the head of the accounting faculty at Cambridge University. And he's also been running a disinformation summit, or the summit itself is next July. Uh, but the the prep for the summit is a series of webinars that have been happening already and continue to go on and will continue until the summit. Alan, thank you very much for joining us. Hey, yeah, thanks, James. This is a passion topic for me because I think disinformation is affecting everybody and particularly it's relevant for business now. So I'm happy to talk about it. Awesome, awesome. And I should mention in full disclosure, Alan and I are actually friends, not just like Facebook friends or LinkedIn friends, but actually like, you know, real life friends, like in, in the real old fashioned sense of the word. So it, it's great to have him today. And, and maybe that means I don't have to cut him as much slack as I may a normal guest. <laughs> so, so Alan, uh, l let me start with this. I mean, w let me put what I know where I can think about on the table. And I have my little notes here on my phone. Um, you know, it seems like disinformation has always been an issue. Uh, you know, since since years ago, I mean, you know, we, we had uh, I remember in the 1950s, the U.S. CIA apparently planned to to airdrop uh, uh, extra large condoms that were labeled smaller medium into Russia, into North Korea or other communist regimes. Apparently they never like followed through with that. But uh, that would be a, a very simplified example of, of disinformation, uh, which I think you would define as the deliberate uh, action with the deliberate intent to to create a false impression as opposed to misinformation, technically speaking, which is which could be inadvertent or accidental. Dis D for disinformation can be like D equals deliberate, deliberate attempt to spread wrong ideas. Um, in a nutshell, how might disinformation apply to business, apply to investors? Because, because this would seem to be an area that uh, people like you uh, have done a really good job of building this structure of of very well regulated financial reporting around. Uh, there there are clear standards, or pretty clear standards. Uh, there's there's good enforcement. There are rather severe penalties, both legally and and financially, in the markets if companies do wrong things. So it would seem like of all the areas of the world, uh, financial reporting, which is not the only information people use for investing, but it is certainly a key piece. It would seem like that's better than than most areas. Yeah, James, thanks for bringing it up and thanks for defining disinformation and versus misinformation. I, I got interested in this a while ago because the accounting infrastructure, particularly around financial reporting, as you noted, is so structured. 
And we have spent a lot of time in my field dealing with things like earnings management or manipulating financial reporting to defraud the market. And we have pretty good infrastructure. I mean, we still have Enrons, we still have wild card, wire cards and things like that. But for the most part, our structure is pretty sound, as you noted. Um, but what I started thinking about was seeing all the disinformation circulating around us, and particularly in the social environments and the political environments. And they were accelerating a lot of the problems that are affecting society at large. So we're seeing things like civil war, we're seeing the war in Russia, you noted issues in other regions. Uh, there's a lot of disinformation for around the pandemic. And, and on the surface, one might think that that doesn't really affect businesses, but in fact, it actually backflows into businesses. And the way I describe disinformation is it's an accelerant, like kerosene for all of the other problems businesses might face. In addition, there may actually now be deliberate disinformation campaigns that can trip up management of a company. And so this is sort of how I view disinformation as something that can affect everything that, that uh, operationally or logistically that a company might face. So we can break that down if you want in a little bit. Yeah. Is it a bigger problem? I mean, just off the top of my head, as, as someone new to this, uh, you know, these days you've got a situation technologically, anybody can be a publisher. And that's great in many respects, but it's also dangerous in many respects. And often we can mask who the real publisher is of stuff, right? If I don't want to go out under my name, I can get a fake account. Um, the other thing is we've got we got a lot of retail traders, and as we saw with you know GameStop and AMC, who are you know it's not like the old days where you had professional guys in, in, in suits and ties uh, digesting the 10Ks. We still have that, and that's still probably the bulk of the money moving the markets. But increasingly, we have not just retail traders relying on KOL, you know, influencers and, and, and social media posts and things like that. Um, but believe it or not, we've got uh, institutions trading off of that effect. And this is a little nuanced, but if you look at the GameStop saga specifically, after a couple of days, I mean, the retail investors lit the match. But after a couple of days, the bulk of the trading was actually institutions. They were playing off of the retail dynamic. And, and so the retail people have a have more leverage than perhaps they realize is what I'm getting to. And if they're if they're misinformed, it could potentially start a you know an avalanche of 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 additional money that that may be managed by some algorithm or some policy that doesn't necessarily care about the truth. It just cares about the momentum of the price. Uh, do you think it's it's is that one of the more salient areas of the market where disinformation is is a factor these days? So that's what I would call direct disinformation issues. So one of the more one of the more problematic areas when disinformation is coming in is in that space where people are planting information. And I don't think this is particularly new to this environment, but people are planting information to try to manipulate stock price or to try to affect changes in product market. Um, this wasn't necessarily related, but if you go back to the Tylenol scandal, that was actually a problem. But you can see where misinformation or disinformation could actually affect product markets, which could flow into stock prices and things like that. So, so a dedicated campaign. And the Tylenol scandal, for those who, in 1982, I believe, it was somewhere near Chicago. Some guy poisoned a couple of Tylenol bottles, and they pulled it off all the shelves all over the U.S. And it ended up being like a good PR thing for Johnson & Johnson because, you know, they were so responsive. But like, you know, originally it was, it was quite scary at the time. Yeah, and you, yeah, and, and and that was a legitimate tainting that happened by somebody who planted it. But you can imagine now where somebody could just plant sort of a storyline around uh, in, in pharmaceutical food or something like that, and 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 if you plant the seed out there, then it can kind of get picked up by bots, or you can even buy bots now. They're not that expensive, from what I understand. That can kind of amplify this stuff. And if you get into the right feed feedback loops, and if you generate emotional resonance, as we saw with Cambridge Analytica around political stuff that stuff might go viral and you might be able to kind of get some action on product markets or even financial markets as, as you noted. And then, and then you also have the amplification of those who are picking it up in the algorithmic trading. So, so that's one avenue. And I consider that to be a direct, direct impact of disinformation. Another direct impact vehicle for disinformation now is tied up into the political positions of companies. And this is something that my colleagues and I are starting to look at when we're actually getting into announcements around political positions, or if we have CEOs who are politically oriented and they're communicating that out there, then there may be some political backlash and or disinformation campaigns that come in either at the executive level and or into the company level to try to disrupt the company. And, and if you will, have some sort of political style or 
or public preference punishment against this. And that's that's another direct disinformation campaign we're picking up elements of. So just to zoom in on that, just to zoom in on that, like an example might be if a CEO of a company takes a stance, let's say, you know, pro or con abortion or pro or con, you know, get gay rights or transgender rights, whatever. And, and someone else outside the company doesn't like that. Um, they may... Uh, they may try to be because the, the company is publicly traded and has that vulnerability. Uh, they may attempt to, to use disinformation to sort of punish both the CEO and that company uh, in that way, basically. Yeah. And, and, and to be fair, I mean, this has always been a trigger point in some cases where people might boycott or they might actually do arguably legitimate stuff, um, whatever. They might try a campaign around signatures or something like that. Uh, but but the idea now that it's reasonably easy to put out false information into the into the consumer market, and I can see, I, I guess the consumer market, as I'm thinking of it, is the public social media market um, for consumption, and then and then having that amplified through through networks, I think is is a very viable. And those are the direct disinformation ideas that I have in my head with respect to businesses, and I and I think. When we're talking to executives, they need to be very careful about both and, and actually have an active management team taking a look for um, the kinds of campaigns that are floating out there. Is it mainly social media these days that, you know, that, that when we talk about disinformation being a bigger problem? And I agree. I mean, it is it is this you know secret, insidious thing that's probably going to be much, much, much bigger problem in five years and 10 years. The quantity of information out there has gone up a lot. Unfortunately, the quality has dropped it's in an, an era where anybody can be a publisher. Anyone can open a Facebook account. Um, so back to the question, is, is it mostly uh, social media based or are there other channels as well? So a lot of it is social media, but what we're trying to do, uh, and this is something I'm actually learning more about with studying the how journalism and psychologists and other fields look at disinformation, Part of the part of a successful disinformation campaign is getting kind of um, almost like money laundering, getting getting the bad information laundered through legitimate sources. And so, what we've seen patterns of is where legitimate media, well, mainstream media or newspapers or others, will pick up feeds on some of this and and may not necessarily either fact check it or they're actually just writing around the story itself. Hey, somebody's claiming something. So there's, there's an opportunity for that to get picked up in some of the mainstream sources as well. And those who are sophisticated with disinformation are purposely trying to find a mainstream avenue. In addition, we're seeing a lot of movement into the mainstream, into polls. So a lot of audiences trying to get eyeballs on it. You've got some very strong right wing and very strong left wing audience polls. And so some of these mainstream media sources are in fact dens for misinformation or disinformation by design. And so they, they're, they're working under a false presumption that they're actually doing some sort of journalistic integrity, but in fact, they seem to be just kind of mainstreaming bad information. Well, you know, as, as someone who's been in the, the financial media space or the, I guess, in, yeah, in financial media space, I would say for the past 18 or so years, I can tell you that journalists are, are huge copycats. Uh, you know, everyone's trying to get, get work done with the least effort so that they'll often just copy someone else's story, not literally, but like copy a story idea, you know, just rephrase some points. So if once someone wants some disinformation piece by, by some, you know, malignant actor breaks into the, the mainstream, it, it's very easy for that, that type of thing to spread. Um, I was going to say on, on the social media point, like I, I know from, from doing business with China, I mean, there's all, and I've done literally, literally hundreds of interviews on Chinese media and, and some of the stations I, or programs I won't do anymore because it, it just got too cheap. I mean, it's, it's designed to look like real news, but it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's heavily biased. And, and, you know, I don't want to lend, you know, my, you know, uh, foreign face basically to their program, which they, they wanted. Um, but for example, in, in China, which gave, China gave a lot of masks to Italy uh, during the pandemic and other European countries as well. But I, I remember a particular article. Uh, first of all, it was apparently done with sort of a, a secret handshake agreement that there would be a big public thank you. And I guess that part is OK. But apparently uh, the CCP was buying Italian social media accounts and posting all these like fake thank you messages like, oh, China, we love you. We love you. Th thank you so much, China, uh, to give this impression that the crowd is going along with it. And, and luckily, those posts didn't really get much engagement. And, and right now, I think the CCP's efforts are fairly simplistic, but I, I don't think they're going to remain simplistic for long. And 
I mention this, A, because it's very accessible, social media. B, because it, it looks like someone else is doing it. And C, because it, it, it tugs on a, a cognitive bias, a psychological tendency to think, oh, the crowd is going along with something. The crowd has this view. In reality, it doesn't. It's a few people in, in the government of the, the, the Communist Party of China that most people would, would – largely disagree with. They would disagree with their values on life. They would disagree with their approach to uh, managing a country. They would disagree with a lot of those things, but it's being masked and, and blended, and, and it creates this totally different perception. Um, how, and I, you know, I, I guess so into my question, I even forgot what the question was, but I guess, I, I guess my, my thinking or my fear is that right now, we are still at a point where we can look at disinformation and, and sometimes laugh and say, oh, this is obvious, how silly. And, and those posts don't get a lot of engagement because it looks cheesy. You know, China the, uh, used to see a lot of Chinese posts under Wall Street Journal articles. And it was, you know, obviously a Chinese sounding name. And he would say, this guy's an idiot. China is great. And, and that's kind of obviously, you know, or it's, it's much more suspicious or looking like a Chinese Communist Party post than, than what they're doing now, which is creating very, uh, you know, Western seeming names and, and trying to blend some praise and some falsehood in to make it look more believable. Um, I guess my que question would be, uh, you know, are we nearing a tipping point where uh, it gets harder and harder to control this information, number one, and, and how do we do it? Is it the job of the platforms? It just seems like an almost an insurmountable task. Yeah. So with res with respect to the specific anecdotes on China, I, I don't have any insight into China specifically, but I I will say that there there is um, definitively a lot of state actors now who are in the game. They've always been in the disinformation game. I mean, we we had a colleague who did a lot of uh, war propaganda working with us uh, for the UK government, and they're in they're in the propaganda disinformation game. I mean, so countries and state actors have long been in the disinformation game throughout wars. Throughout even the history. good guys, even the good guys. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> we can, <laughs> we can define that as differently. Um, <laughs> however you want to do that. But the, the idea here is though to recognize that disinformation is not particularly new. The tactics are reasonably similar from what I understand. It's just the vehicles that we have are, are more accessible and they're more accessible with micro targeting down to people who can't necessarily do all the kind of skepticism or or the critical thinking or they haven't been trained to do the critical thinking um and 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 they're also looking for specific nuggets that resonate with them emotionally and that that kind of gets into the cambridge analytica stuff where they 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 micro targeted people who were already emotionally ready to grab onto pieces of information but with respect to um some of the points you, you had asked how do we how do we prevent it? Before I get there, I, I also want to I, I, I want to color a point. Then I'll get back to this. I think I think arguably one of the biggest ways in which disinformation is affecting business, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, is it's it's actually disrupting everything in the world, which then flows into businesses to be risk resilient. So we see, for example, human migration, forced human migration risk as a as a function of disinformation, and that affects everything from supply chain to to demand and products and labor supply and things like that. So, so we're seeing a lot of actual business operational disruption, um, including pandemic disruption and things like that. So businesses need to recognize that even though they might ne not necessarily be targeted directly by disinformation, it's coming at them through secondary effects, through global market effects. Um, so I thought a little bit about how to, how to counter it. And it, the answer is not easy. Um, I've often wondered why we don't hold financial or non-financial information to the same set of standards that we hold financial information. So if you look at accounting through a lens, we've got, again, standard setters, we've got regulators, we've got auditors, we've got audit committees, we have internal audit, we have all of this stuff to try to prevent false information from coming through. And as a result, our leaders in our corporations are very careful, but for one or two chaos agents out there, very careful in what they communicate publicly because they are held accountable. When you move out into the public domain space where arguably the impact is larger, there's almost no recourse for saying blatant disinformation. And so at some point we need some accountability. The problem in that space, which gets into, it gets into free, re, free 
free speech rights discussions and what's the boundary of free speech rights and is it does it a lot are you allowed to blatantly lie if that can harm somebody um you know one could argue that that if you're blatantly lying and you're knowingly i mean if you're knowingly purposely lying to hurt somebody with respect to things like you know a pandemic risk should you be held accountable is that is that a violation of you know free speech rights and that that's a gray area that um that some political scientists are grappling with I do think it would help to have some accountability for the platforms, and maybe this is a legal liability kind of accountability or something to that nature where where we hold them accountable, especially for the algorithms that pump this stuff through. And, and to be fair, I do know that some of them are working on that algorithmic stuff. The one thing that I, that I recognize from the research that we've done is and I, I don't mean research in a traditional sense. This is my casual learning about this information and how, how it's being treated is education on critical thinking at the grade school level. So there are countries, um, Estonia, I have case examples in our feed on LinkedIn around the summit from Estonia. I know Finland are two examples where they have critical thinking skills and specific disinformation woven throughout their training programs in schools all the way through to grade school education where these children have to actually do propaganda campaigns. They have to unravel propaganda. And arguably, or at least from from what these papers say, they have the most resilient generational uh, you know, huh. people who, who can, who can target this information. So a lot of it is simply, so the, and that's because they're close to Russia, right? So that has a lot to do with, yeah, kind of inoculate them. It is inoculating yeah. them from Russian propaganda, which is, which has been studied by many, many, many people, Rand corporation included. So, so I do think, I do think there, there are some tactics on inoculating the actual disinformation as well. When it's out there, there are ways in which one can actually combat disinformation campaigns while they're active um, but I think I think the real core is getting training down at the grade school level, so that so so that entire societies can be a little bit more skeptical, and they can actually pause before they they share stuff. They pause and reflect before they share. You, you mentioned platforms earlier. Uh, what happens when a big, wealthy, powerful person with a large following? Uh, owns one of those platforms. I mean, we, we haven't had that situation yet, but like, you know, people like Elon Musk or, or Donald Trump, uh, both of them are very influential. Both of them are very outspoken. Both of them have relatively large bases of followers who, who might prioritize, you know, whatever those guys have to say over, uh, you know, the, the process of fact checking or, or let me say this, they would have more trust in in, you know, kind of the guru, uh, their, their leader than they would have in, uh, you know, some government uh, regulated platform. Uh, do you think there's a risk uh, that, that we're going to have platforms run by, by moguls under free speech standards that, that exacerbate disinformation? Or, or do you think that will be uh, negated somehow? Yeah, I do fear for that. I see I see a lot of threats to information quality, and I call these people chaos agents in general. And a lot of them are trying to kind of disrupt the information systems, the accountability systems that we currently have. So you mentioned Elon Musk for an, as an example. He's one who, um, among other things, not only is he trying to take over Twitter, which has caused some concern for some people, it's not clear yet to me what he plans to do with Twitter. So I'm holding out on that. I, I don't have a judgment about what he intends to do with Twitter until I kind of get a better understanding of that. But what is interesting about him is the existing infrastructure we have around financial reporting is under some threat where he's now taking that infrastructure into the court system and claiming free speech rights. So he's pulled the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, into some court action um, with respect to, hey, why is it that you are coming after me for what I'm saying on Twitter when, in fact, I have a free speech right, which is really an interesting scenario, which I have wondered, this has led me to wonder, like, why haven't we seen them coming after this structure that we rely on for security in our financial reporting infrastructure? Why hasn't somebody come after it yet under free speech rights and how is it protected? Um hmm. But then, then the other avenue would be, as you noted, owning my own system and grabbing a, a following around the system. I guess 
if it gets into financial markets, I mean, if somebody's sophisticated and, and all these people are heading down there and they're being led down a path, I suppose there's maybe some arbitrage opportunity to take advantage of them if they're wrong. But um, but I do think it's problematic where we're, we're losing our ability as a society in general or as a global society to actually discern what's being blatantly shared with us as lies and what's actually sort of verifiable or at least there's an evidence pattern to kind of present counter data and counter perspective. Yeah, and you mentioned an arbitrage me you know, mechanism to take advantage of them if they're wrong, and there could be, and that could be a great way to pull things back to, to normal, but if enough people are, are wrong for, for a long enough time, uh, you know, that kind of creates its own reality mm -hmm. Uh, too, in a way, and and I should I should be clear. I I'm, I'm, I think I speak for you, Alan, as well. I mean, we're, we're talking about Elon Musk, or I mentioned Trump um, as examples. Uh, I'm not necessarily you know vilify. I mean, Trump didn't even get a chance to start his platform yet, uh, and, and Musk also hasn't bought Twitter yet. So uh, I don't think either of us are accusing them of, of wrongdoing per se at this point. And and you know, I think a lot of their followers may be watching, and, and that's great. I'm just I think they are examples though of people who have really broken the mold. I mean, traditionally in both politics and in business, uh, the leaders w would be reticent, would be relatively reluctant to share and very careful about their wording. And, and both Trump and Musk, I'm sure there are going to be more people like them in the future, are, are quite the opposite. They're very outspoken and you almost got to rein them in. You know, they're very prolific. So it, it's just the exact opposite of how the communication model has traditionally worked in both of those spheres. Yeah, and I, I agree. Just to just to follow up with what you said, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty apolitical when I discuss this. I'm looking at this from the perspective of information and the effects of information on society. And we've seen count, countless examples where people either recklessly or maliciously throw information out that damages society in some way. And we see it literally showing up in deaths or wars. I mean, you could argue that the entire Ukraine war is being fed off of the disinformation engine right now um, about denazification and other stuff. And, and, and they're just, from at least my perspective and from what I've seen from our side, it's hard to, it's hard to justify those claims, um, at least from the Western perspective that I've been observing. So I, I just... I agree with you. These are these are examples, but they're vibrant ones. And, and I like Musk as an example, as you noted, because he's he's basically saying, hey, um, I do have rights to speak freely and the SEC is trying to constrain me and I don't think they should be allowed to. But then if if he breaks that hold on the SEC and if he, if he kind of unravels their ability to to come after speech that might uh, a mat, that might actually manipulate markets. Um, then I think that's problematic as it cascades throughout other other markets. Yeah, you know, the, the whole thing I'm thinking about, you know, this is a personal story I read on CNN or somewhere moments before we recorded, but some, some mother in Utah uh, had a son and the, and the dad left the family. He, he suddenly became gay and then just kind of checked out and the son was emotionally vulnerable and, you know, was apparently, you know, pretty good kid before. And he fell in with this, uh, you know, right wing extremist uh, white supremacy group, I, I think, and, and just kind of, you know, took off that way. Uh, and, and that's a pretty clear cut case, it seems like, of an emotionally vulnerable person suddenly stumbling into something. Uh, that type of thing was always there, just like illegal drugs were always out there in the world. But suddenly imagine a world where you have illegal drugs on every corner and they're more powerful than ever before. And, and, and perhaps it's a little bit of what we're entering into in this age of, of more information and, and more disinformation. It's just, it's more prevalent. Uh, it's potentially much more powerful, much more easy to amplify a voice. And it's harder to root out who the real, you know, bad actor is, what the real truth is. Kind of like, to shift analogy, like the MIT blackjack team. I'm, I'm probably a lot of viewers are familiar with that. You know, in the old days, if you counted cards in blackjack, the casino would watch and they would kick you out. Uh, and then in the 1970s or 80s, a bunch of MIT kids got together and said, hey, if we make a team of us where some are losing, some are winning, we play different roles, it'll be much harder for the casino to find out, you know, what we're doing. And they got away with it for a long time. And, and perhaps it's a little bit what's going on here. It's just it's, it's much more spread out over different platforms, different people. Uh, and it's a lot more scary. Uh, it's certainly something that I think is not on the radar of enough people. But, Alan, thanks to, to efforts of people like you and, and those at Cambridge and those participating in the conference, it's certainly becoming on the radar of more people. And I would say that awareness is, is probably the first step and, and, and perhaps government action, which is scary, I know, to a lot of listeners. But perhaps uh, the government is at least better than, than a lot of the other actors out there, at least uh, 
the the many of the Western governments, I would say, and I know people criticize them, but as someone who is familiar with some other governments, I can say uh, there is certainly worse uh, to be had out there as well. So uh, it sounds like a mix of awareness and regulation are perhaps the first steps towards making a, the future a little bit better. Anything to add to that, Alan? Yeah, so I, 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 think, I think critical thinking skills, I think the ability to call out disinformation when it's happening, I think um, trying to help people understand that, you know, that, that there's other data available to counter what they're learning or what they're hearing is critically important. I would like to see a lot more critical thinking skills. I'd like to see a lot more focus on alternative data so that people know how to access and are actually encouraged mm -hmm. and incentivized to access other data. And I would actually like to see liability trickling down into the content providers. Yeah, I love it. Have better, making better BS detectors of, of people, basically, and, and holding uh, holding providers accountable. I mean, those all make sense to me. Uh, I, I keep giving Chinese examples just because what I know. But I know in China, a lot of times these, these bad platforms will pick smaller influencers and attack them viciously with maybe some truth, maybe some falsehoods. And then two or three days later, they'll just delete the article. Because the, the punishment would have just been deleting the article anyway, so they don't care. And then they, they do this just to build up followers. Then they produce a real legitimate attack on someone who's truly very famous, and it gets many more views because they've sort of you know, built up followers in this illicit manner uh, because there is no accountability, and I think there should be some. Uh, so, so, Alan, if someone is watching this and is interested, would like to learn more, uh, we mentioned the, the Cambridge Summer a couple of times uh, coming in July of next year, but there are some webinars lead that have been uh, uh, happening already and will happen in the future. How can someone get plugged in? How can someone find out more? So we're hosting the Cambridge Disinformation Summit, and we're just trying to collect uh, colleagues in my field and, and in other information science fields, including journalism and and. Um, um, marketing and management and, and political psychology and other fields to, to convene, to have a sharing of the mind so that we can actually cross, you know, cross pollinate ideas on how, what, what we're doing as a society around this. Uh, but the Cambridge Disinformation Summit, probably the easiest way to find us is to Google Cambridge Disinformation Summit and you'll find our webpage. We also have a YouTube page where, we're run, where we've run our prior webinars, um, all but one are uh, available on YouTube in their full content. And then we're gonna host Several more webinars. We're doing one on greenwashing coming up. I've also, I'm also in planning, but not yet scheduled one with one of the prime ministers who is responsible for implementing the education platform in the grade schools to illustrate how they came around with that idea and how they've implemented that and how successful it is and why it's successful so that we get an idea of how we can at least inoculate the next generation around this and try to get more people who have critical thinking skills. So this is where we're heading, and um, you can also email me. I have my contact information out there as well. Alan, thanks very much, not just for, for joining us here today, but also for what you're doing. This is a, an important cause, a cause that may not get enough billing, but, but hopefully thanks to you know, your efforts, it, it will get more and more billing. Uh, Alan, Jag uh, Alan Jagelizner, thanks again, and thanks to you for watching at home. Thanks, James. Hi there. My name is Brian Christopher. In my letter, Follow the Money, we track the activity of insiders. I encourage you to check it out. And today I want to talk to you about something that is very timely. In today's investing world, with stocks down from their highs, I believe it's important to generate a wish list or wish lists of stocks that you may want to buy in the future. Even though stocks are trading weekly right now, that will change and we want to be ready. Here are some thoughts about how to create a potential wish list. I saw this image in a tweet the other day. It was posted by Liz Ann Saunders of Schwab. It's not surprising given the weakness in equity prices. Today, a greater than normal percentage of stocks are trading below the cash and short-term investments they hold. If a company has lots of cash, it will generally do okay in tough times. That was the inspiration for this wish list. To generate my wish list, I screen for the stocks that met my criteria. I normally recommend stocks in the UK, the US, or Canada, so that's where I looked. I screen for stocks whose cash and investments were greater than their market cap. I wanted the best of the best, so I looked for stocks that generated positive free cash flow in the past 12 months as well. Remember, free cash flow is operating cash flow minus capital expenditures. If a company is generating more cash than it invests, 
it has a margin of safety that is appealing during times like today. And I looked for stocks with a minimum market cap. I also removed financials because I ran this screen for operating businesses that aren't lenders. After I generated that list, I got even more specific. In addition to having cash greater than the market cap, I also wanted the company to be able to pay off its debt if it chose to do so. So I further reduced the list to the names that had cash and investments that were greater than their market cap and their debt. Here are the results. To be clear, this is just a starting point. These are not investment recommendations. They still may have other hair or warts that make them uninvestable. For example, you can see two of these five names have not grown their revenue on average over the past five years. That's an example of one way to further assess these names. Also, FYI, I generated this screen using Bloomberg, but there are other screeners out there as well. For example, Finviz, TradingView, Zax, Yahoo Finance, among others. And your online broker likely offers one as well. Again, you'll have to do more work, but hopefully this quick video gives you an idea of a way that you can use the news, or in this case Twitter, to generate some investment ideas. I don't know if any of these ideas will become actual recommendations. I just wanted to show you how you can think about generating a wish list. If you like this video, let us know, and we can create more using different assumptions. Thank you.